I'll tell you what, I felt like I've had church this morning. How about you guys? It's interesting because I've not really shared with anyone what I'm going to begin ministering this morning. Now, we have just finished up uh, the new wineskins. We've dealt with the tabernacle within. And we're, I, I want to kind of launch off of what we did last week to get into this week. Is that okay? I want to go into Exodus chapter 25 and verse 16. And this just jumped out at me. And you know, when the Holy Spirit causes part of the word to jump out at you, there's a reason for it. It's not just because you've never seen it before, but it's because he's trying to teach you something. And this was in the construction of the Ark of the Covenant. This is God's throne upon the earth, and it is a replica of the one that's in heaven. Now notice what he says here in verse 16. And thou shalt put in the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. Hmm. I'm giving you a testimony because now you're in blood covenant with me that you had, I'm, I'm undoing what Adam did in the garden and I'm about ready to give you a testimony. And our testimony normally is, I was saved from my sin, now I'm in church forever. <laughs> That's the basic testimony. But how many know, God, yeah, God wants to forgive you of your sins, but there's a whole lot more to the testimony that God wants to give you. And there's three things that God had them place in that ark that he called your testimony. I want that to settle in here just a minute. Because a lot of believers don't have a testimony because they don't understand authority. They don't understand a lot of things. The first one was Aaron's rod that budded. That equals authority. God authorized him to be the high priest when there was contention with Korah over who the high priest was going to be. That whole thing, God to prove who he anointed, who he delegated authority to, was demonstrated in Aaron's rod that budded. So he said, part of your testimony is spiritual authority. Secondly, there was a jar of manna, God's divine provision. That's supposed to be part of your testimony. The other one were the two tablets. God's commandments being reestablished in your life is a part of your testimony. Now, Here's what's interesting. Those were three of the things that Adam lost in the garden. God's testimony was that he was restoring through covenant what man had lost in the garden. Turn to your neighbor and say, oh man! Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. In Bereshit, in the beginning. It's just amazing to me just how oblivious most of the body of Christ are, are, are to the things I'm going to be talking about this morning. In fact, in many ways, either we're ignorant or we have theologies against them. And if you understand it's supposed to be part of your testimony, then you have a theology against your testimony. No wonder the body of Christ is so messed up right now. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now we think that's just God saying, Oh, just go and frolic and be happy. When you look at the phraseology in the Hebrew, it's exactly the same as when God said, let there be light. They're commands. They're not suggestions. God created Adam and Eve and set them down and began to command them, be fruitful and multiply. That's a command of God. Come on now. That's a command. And fruitful is different than multiply. He didn't say have kids and have kids. 
Multiplying is having kids. Being fruitful is everything that you set your hands to do prosper. The creativity of God flowing through you is being fruitful, and that's a command of God. Taking dominion is a command of God. When God commanded Adam to take dominion, Adam was under the authority of God, and therefore he had delegated authority to function in the earth and to take that dominion. Therefore, taking authority is a command. Does that make sense? And it, in the Hebrew, it has the same infinitive as when God said, let there be light or let the firmament separate, or you know, let all these things, every command that he issued it has, it has the same structure and the same understanding in the Hebrew. They weren't suggestions. They weren't just blessings. And here's another thing we need to understand. God blessed them. How did God bless them? By giving them commandments. And now today in the church, we, we beg for the blessings of God because we have separated ourselves from his commandments. Am I making sense this morning? Now let's jump over to Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. You know, it's amazing how clear things become when you actually go back to the Bible. Not taking a snippet, not taking just a little phrase. You know, when, when, I, when I preach like this, people will say, well, Paul said I'm not under the law. Yes, he did, but in another place he said we are under the law in Christ. What? You forgot about that verse, didn't you? We just like taking these little snippets. How about the full counsel of God? Get the big picture. Get the full picture. Verse 15. And the Lord took, uh, and the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, took the man and put him in the, in the, into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So those were another commandment. Dress it, keep it, guard over it. And the Lord commanded the man, that, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely, but... Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Does that sound like a command? Actually, he said it was. You don't have to speculate on that. Now, authority, listen to this, authority is wrapped up in commandments. Without the command to take authority, man had no authority, was not authorized to move in authority. Man was placed under the authority of God so that he could move in delegated authority. Now, how many know man lost that in the garden? But what did Jesus say when he rose from the dead? All power or actually authority in the Greek, has been given unto me. Now you go. I got her back, as we would say in the Ozarks. I got it back. You lost it. I got it back. Now I'm back in my place. I have restored the authority. Now I am delegating because you have surrendered to me. I am delegating for you to go forth. Man had provision in the garden. Man had everything he needed. God placed him in a situation not just to survive, but to thrive. That's right. To be fruitful. That's Being good. fruitful is thriving. Yeah. You, can't, you can't be fruitful and just survive. Right. Just surviving is called just getting by. That's not thriving. That's not fruitful. God gave him commandments. Here's what we're finding in the Ark of the Covenant. Commandments. Commandments, guys, existed before the fall. Ow. They existed before the fall. These commandments gave Adam delegated authority to move into authority to thrive in the garden and to multiply in the earth. Now, 1 John tells us that violation of God's commandments, violation of the law or violation of Torah is sin. Now, I want you to wrap your theological head around this. Adam had to have commandments, otherwise he could not have sinned. Now, 
Now, there's a lot of Christian theologians going <laughs> right now. Well, that's the truth. He, if, he, if God would have said, just go out and frolic, play, take dominion, and he did all that, but there was this one don't. Yeah. Don't need that tree. But here, here, here is our conundrum in the body of Christ now. Co violation of commandments, if I violate them, it is sin. At the same time, without them, I can't have authority. Wow. Now you realize why most of the body of Christ, uh, their, their authority level is more like a wet sock. They bark at the devil, and what they don't tell you is how much he ate their lunch all the week. And they come back and they put a face on at church. When man fell, he lost the ability to move an authority directly submitted to vine authority. He was now under the authority of Lucifer. Man was born again, first time in the garden. He was born from life unto death. Satan seized that authority... And the Bible called him the God, little g, of this world. Because Adam surrendered it to him when he obeyed another voice. He also lost the ability to receive direct supernatural provision from God. We would have to gain or be fruitful by the sweat of our brow, and there would be resistance in the earth to our thriving. That's right. That's right. He discovered something else grew up in your thorns and thistles. He also lost the ability to keep the commandments of God because within him was birthed iniquity. Iniquity means to be against the law, anonomia. He actually came under another law, the law of sin and death. The kingdom of darkness has its Torah the kingdom of God has its Torah. Iniquity causes you to have the laws of the law of the laws of sin and death written on your hearts. You are jaundiced to the laws of God, and you you're you're carnal. What does the Bible say? Carnal, sensual, devilish. This kind of wisdom you flow on. That that that's the nature of Satan. And that's what Paul had to delineate in the book of Romans. He said, he said, I was trying to live God's law, but I couldn't live God's law because one day I woke up and realized there was another law functioning in me, the law of sin and death. But praise be to God that Jesus has set me free of the law of sin and death because now I have the law of life in Christ Jesus. Law. God's law won. The devil thought his law, but the law won, okay? The law of sin and death is still the motivation of a lot of Christian preaching and teaching today because it's antinomian. It is against God's law. And we put this veneer over it called grace. Grace is not the ability to continue under the law of sin and death. Grace is the ability to overcome that and to move in the law of life in Christ Jesus. Why God called that his testimony, he said that through promise covenant, God was working on restoring what man lost in the garden. <laughs> If provision and authority are interdependent on the commandments of God, it is no wonder why the enemy has worked so hard to create such a jaundice against the commandments within the body of Christ. It separates us from our divine authority and our divine provision, thus greatly diminishing the testimony of God in the body. Ouch. <laughs> I want to deal with the first line of authority. You know, whenever I look at the fall, 
in Genesis chapter 3. I always thought the first place that Adam failed was he didn't grab up that serpent and say, won't you just shut up? Who told you you could talk to my woman? And so I always thought his, his first failure was not taking authority over the serpent. But the more that I've prayed and meditated on the scripture, I've come to realize taking authority over the ser- serpent was number two. Where Adam began to fall is he didn't take authority over himself. That's right. right. Self control. And let me tell you something, the greatest threat to you taking authority in this life is your own self-control. If you can't take authority on the inside, you can't come against the devil on the outside because the devil on you is bigger maybe than the devil on the outside. That was so significant when Jesus came against Satan and he said, Lucifer, you have nothing in me. Bow the knee, baby. And one of the things that this generation has absolutely lost is self-control. And so I want to deal just a little bit about self-control this morning. Because until you get self-control down, you're not going to have any other control over anything else. Now you can turn to your name before you say, oh, man, that was good. Now you go, oh, man. (laughs) Oh, man. Self-control or willpower is three-dimensional. It is a spiritual force. It is a psychological slash neurological force. And it is also a physiological force. Because when God created self-control, he wanted it to control all aspects of you. And unless you understand how self-control works in your life, you're never going to have it. I've been reading a book, I've been listening to a book, this one I got on uh, an audio book. It's called The Willpower Instinct. And And it was written by Dr. Kelly Mac. Gonagall, she was, teaches at Stanford University, and she began, to, she began developing a course. She is, she is a, a neuroscientist, and so based upon what she has learned ab- upon our, our neurophysiology and all these different things, she developed a course that's called The Science of Self-Control. And so, you know, the first class, she had 10, 15, 20 students, and she's been teaching it a couple of years now. She now fills the largest classroom that Stanford University has because this generation is realizing we have no self-control. And people are taking the course two, three, four, five times, and they're bringing their teenagers saying, could they please come and audit the class? Because not only do I need self-control, dear Lord, my teenager needs some self-control. The hormones kicked in and logic went right out the window. And so I've, I've been listening to it, and I want to draw from some of the things out of that book. And you've you got to realize she's not a believer. She is a scientist. And so where she talks about how the brain's developed. Now, you know how we always talk about we're spirit, soul, and body? Did you know that you have three brains? that there are actually three separate brains that make up your brain, so even your brain's in the image of God, really cool thing. And so, you know, I look at that and say, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. She looks at it and says, you know, evolution doesn't waste anything. It never does away with it, just adds to. So at the very, at the very, the last part of the brain that was the, the frontal lobe that was created, there, there was a prefrontal cortex, and within that prefrontal cortex, there is, there is a mechanism within that that releases self-control. And I'm thinking, no, all that's created in the image of God. And how many know that in the spirit, I have supernatural self-control if I will yield to the Holy Spirit? Let's go to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. One of the, some of the things we're going to get into today, and I, I think one of the reasons God was saying so much in the praise and worship a surrender, relax in me, lay down your burden is because everything right now structured of the way the world is, is to get you to where you have no self-control. 
You see, there are neurological buttons that I can push. There are physiological buttons that I can push that will neutralize your self-control. But we as believers, as we trust and walk with God, we can short-circuit those triggers and move back to kingdom. Now, I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible because I, I think the Amplified does such a wonderful job. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which his presence within accomplishes, boy, I like that, is love, joy, or gladness, peace, patience, it goes on to find it as an even temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, or benevolence, fruitfulness, gentleness, which also is meekness and humility, self-control. And it goes on to find that as self-resistant. Against such, there is no law that can be charged. So part of the fruit of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit abiding in you is self-control. He's trying to give you what Adam should have really exercised in the garden but didn't. And every time the enemy comes at you to tempt you, we have to have that spiritual power within us to, to say no. Unless you learn to tell yourself no, you can't ever tell the enemy no. No sometimes is the most powerful word in the English language as far as I'm concerned. We think it's yes. No, it's no. We got to be able to tell our flesh, no, shut up. We got to tell our minds, no, be quiet. We got to tell our spirits, no, I won't move that way. I'm going to trust in the Lord. When you realize that part of the working of the Holy Spirit within provides us self-control, believers should have the greatest level of self-control of anyone on the planet. Boy, have we not failed at that one. I remember years ago, Clark Drizos was our, uh, our academic dean for the school, and his favorite expression was, you know, Christians try to act like Jesus and look more like Buddha every day. No self-control. How many times are believers come constantly getting into trouble because there's no self-control? Today, this generation, now in generations past, those believers were marked with extreme self-control. I, I, like, I like John Wesley. I marvel him. One of the reasons why they were called Methodists wasn't because it was dead, dried, and plucked up. It was because he was so fervent in his walk with God to get everything done in his spiritual disciplines, he had a method to it. He structured out his day with self-control so that he could get his duties done for the Lord, that he get his prayer time in, he got his study time in, and everything else he got in. You know, if he was alive today, he would also probably be working for some daytimer program to help people organize their lives as well as walking with God. Because he had to have a method so that he got it all done, and in every area he exerted self-control. Today, who needs self-control? We got grace. Now, will or self-control operates in all three parts of our makeup. Guys, this morning we're going to get just a peek into how wonderfully and fearfully we're made by God. And God wants to help us begin to move to restore authority, part of his testimony, into our lives. And so I want to get into some things, and I'm going to try to just water this down just a little bit because I don't want to get into the whole things of neurobiology and all these different things, but I just want to get into some, some very simple things. Guys, spiritual, the spiritual aspects of self-control can only come through complete surrender to God. When I completely surrender to Him, I can move in delegated authority. That's why I, I surrender. I almost want to say, I surrender all. We, we need to surrender to his grace. We need to surrender to his presence. We need to surrender to his commandments. We need to surrender to his word. We need to surrender to his kingdom. Because when I do that, the shalom of God comes. And we're going to find out that shalom, that peace of God, is paramount to self-control. 
absolutely paramount. We have got to dedicate ourselves to walk in His commandments. We need to learn how to abide with His Spirit that now resides within our heart. Absolute surrender to God's authority produces delegated authority in our lives. Now, I want to get into understanding some of the aspects of the neurological and physiological aspects of self-control. And neurological science is, is really proving to be fascinating to me. Uh, <laughs> I, I just stand in awe at, at the magnificence of God. Now, there's a portion of our frontal lobe of our brains called the prefrontal cortex. Now, science has discovered that portion of the brain controls self-control. And some, and some of the, the interesting stories about how they, how many know science comes from observation and testing, these different things, and some of the stories that are told, one of them goes all the way back to when they were uh, making, the building the railroads, and this one guy was, was really well known. He had a, a will of iron. He was, he was a planner for the railroad. And man, when he made a schedule, he made a plan. He worked that plan. They lit, he was literally known for having iron will. And he also helped set the dynamite because he wasn't afraid of anything. He'd go help set the dynamite. And one day it went off early and it took one of those big spikes that they do through the railroad and it shot it through his brain. Went right through his frontal lobe. And to their surprise, he survived. Now, they had to go, you know, patch up the holes. And uh, the doctor, even way back then, had to deal with fungus growing out of the brain, all kinds of different things. But he healed up. And he said, I feel fine. But he lost self-control. He made plans and couldn't stick to them. He was all over the place emotionally. He would cry one minute, laugh the next, want to kill you the next. There was no control mechanism left because that portion of his brain had been damaged in the prefrontal cortex. Then years later in modern science, one, uh, one uh, psychiatric physician, uh, this woman was having seizures all the time, and he thought, well, if I go in and just kind of separate this one part in the, free, in the prefrontal cortex, it will stop the seizures, and it did. But that's not the end of the story. After the woman healed and began to get back into her life, she had zero self-control. She would move on any impulse that would come her way to include propositioning family members for sex. Because I mean, you, you want to have that part of your brain functioning. No self-control. And so they figure, okay, this is where the, the, the part of self-control and governance in, 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 in your logic system is right here in the prefrontal cortex. Say, so what does that have to do with anything? Well, there's also something called neuroplasticity. How many have seen that on TV? They've been talking about there's one website that's talking about improving brain function because there, there's something called neuroplasticity. What that basically means, you know, if I, if I pick up a weight... And I, and I lift it, and I start lifting weights, it begins to build bulk, doesn't it? Your brain's the same way, but instead of lifting weights, by, by causing it to do certain activities, you, parts of your brain will actually get bigger. It will grow. It will, it will create new wrinkles. It, it will develop properly. Doing other things will cause entropy. or entr That's not entropy. Entropy, where things reduce. Atherpy. There we go. I always get those two mixed up for some reason. There's a short somewhere in my brain, I guess. <laughs> Can't blame it on a railroad spike. That will reduce that portion of your brain. That, that's, and, and sometimes it's, it's developed in ways that we wouldn't necessarily connect. In, in this one website, they have you playing different games and word associations and all that. And it's actually in, it's, it's causing certain parts of your brain to become active. And as it does, it increases the neuroplasticity in that portion of your brain. You say, what does that have to do with anything? Because you can literally increase the size and the function of your prefrontal cortex. Where your self-control is. God is saying, as you learn to trust in me, and as we begin to move spiritually the way that we're supposed to, it actually causes us to do things physiologically and neurologically if we understand how they function. The very way of moving in the kingdom of God properly will actually build your brain to increase self-control. Isn't that how awesome God is? 
but you got to understand how it all functions. Anybody familiar with the fight or flight response? You're in a situation now in the old days here in the Ozarks. I live eight miles outside of Marshfield, and so I'm making my way in on a wagon or walking or on a horse, and all of a sudden there, there's a mountain lion. How many know? Time to freak out just a little bit, okay? It looks at me and it goes, I see danger, it sees lunch. And the fight or flight response in your body begins to take over. And there's actually a physiological and neurological response to this when it kicks in. How many know that your heart begins to race? Your breathing gets shallow. Adrenaline begins pumping in. But what we don't know is it shuts down your prefrontal cortex. Because you don't want to have to set and examine 50 ways to get away from this lion. As you're examining, he's chowing down. And so you kick into instinct. Now you have one or two instincts. If you know how to fight, have been trained to fight, you kill the thing. The military count on this, guys. Now, now I was administrative in the military. I was never taught hand-to-hand combat, but I was taught how to use a weapon. I can use a weapon without thought. If you set an M16 and you actually take it apart to its basic components, almost without thought, I can put it back together. I can load it and fire within just a couple of seconds because it's instinct anymore. And so people that, whether it's martial arts or boxing or hand-to-hand combat, they train them and 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 train them so that when you're in a fight or flight situation, your mind shuts down, instinct goes in, you kill, 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 kill until you get out of that situation. You go, or if you're like me, you run, 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 run. (laughs) Okay. But... The place where self-control is, this prefrontal cortex becomes dormant. That's why um, people that are like in a car accident, we think they're in shock. They're going, oh. It's that situation shut this down. There's no logic. There's no self-control. And it takes them a while because what happens after the danger pass? You go, and you calm down. Your breath deepens, your heart slows down, and your prefrontal cortex cortex begins to fire again. Okay? Now, what happens if you're constantly under stress? Because we have stress today, but there's no mountain lion. There's nothing that we can run from or fight. And so we're in this constant state of fight or flight and we're beating the air and it shuts down your self-control. That's one of the reasons we have an entire generation without self-control, which is perfect for advertising. Come on. Can I also add this one little thing about the fight and flight? You've had a stressful day. You're just, you're, your nerves are about as thin as hair. You come home, and Junior does something stupid. Not a big thing. You know, he didn't burn down the house or anything. You know, just, just something stupid. And your response is, Rah! You know what you just did to that kid? You put them in fight or flight, and they stare at you like a deer in a headlight. And you're saying, why don't you answer me? You can't. You just shut down their brain. All they can do is go, duh. And if you constantly do that, that will build anger and resentment in the child. And that becomes instinctual to them. So the last thing you want them to do is to have resentment and anger towards you on an 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 instinctive level. That's why daddy or mommy needs to tell you, now Johnny, Okay. Very close to the fight or flight response is the great desire response. 
You see it on guys when they go into Best Buy. And there's the big football game coming, and the 72-inch flat panel is on sale. Their pupils restrict. Insulin is, sh- or, or adrenaline is shooting through their bodies. They're not breathing heavy. They're going, <laughs> their heart, boom, 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 And their self-control just shut off. It's called deep desire. I've had that several times in my life. It's usually after Mary gets fixed up for church or something, you know. There's, there, you see, that's the natural response to desire. Scriptures come up, as a deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after you. That I have such desire from God, it shuts down the reasoning and I'm just panting for his presence. But it's very closely related Everything about modern advertising, and they're using the stress levels to enhance it, is to get you to lose self-control and you buy whatever they put in front of you. And what's interesting, and and I'll, was was I'll, I'll, that I'll kneel, I remember him. The brother's got a lot of information, but he should have just put it in a book, because you will fall asleep listening to I'll kneel, but really a lot of information. I'd, I'd write a little bit, slap myself, write a little bit more. Really good information at the Prophecy Club. And one of the interesting things that there, there, are, there are centers in the United States that are the meccas of advertising. One of them is on Park Avenue, Madison, you know, Madison, Park Avenue, and the building's number is 66. Six, Park Avenue. And what's interesting, he goes all over the country and where there's power places, whether it's a lobbyist or, or advertising, they try, you know, 666 Washington Avenue, 666. You see, because everything about the occult is to manipulate, and there, there is a lot within advertising that is occultic in nature. And so they, they do things, they put things on the screen, they take advantage of what's going on in society to put you, they, they already know you're, you're constantly in a state of fight or flight. And all it takes is a little bump. What you need, big old piece of cheesecake. Yes! And after a rough day, all week, uh, all week long, there's Christians standing out the Cheesecake Factory going, shout out, so you know, they're, they're ready to have church in there, you know. Now, I can say that because I've actually been to a real Cheesecake Factory. I almost rolled out in the floor. I almost had church right there. It's awesome. But that desire, when that kicks in, is the same as the fight or the flight. The prefrontal cortex has been shut down. So you whip out your charge card, you just give in, you just give in. And then what we have done, we have created a society that the only way out of the fight or the flight is to give in to desire. But the desire doesn't release physiologically or neurologically what you need to get out of that mode. So you eat the cheesecake, and now you're anxious not only about the situation, you're also anxious about what you paid for the cheesecake and how it's going to stick to your hips or your belly or whichever part of your body that those things tend to gravitate toward. And now you're more stressed out than you were to begin with. It may have elevated your serotonin levels just a little bit, but it did not reactivate your prefrontal cortex. Devil says, I got you. I got you. I got you. But there's another response possible. It's called the pause and evaluate response. This is actually your normal state of being. Your heart rate normalizes, breathing becomes deep, and your prefrontal cortex reactivates it. Trusting in God is, one, is a part of the step. But did you know that you can do something physically to bypass or to shut down the fight or flight syndrome or the desire syndrome? 
Remember when God said, be still and know that I'm God? You just stop. And when they always talk, you know, if you get real mad to stop and take 10 deep breaths. There's a science to that. If you stop and purposely go against the shallow breathing, Lord, I'm going to relax in you. Lord, I choose to move in the shalom of God. And you take those 10 deep breaths, that physiological reaction will begin to, to percolate through and change the neurology. It will slow down your heart rate. It will bring down the cortisol levels. It will bring down all these different things. And it reactivates your prefrontal cortex. You see, God says if you're not, if you're not, you know, we, we, well, you're not spiritual enough to do this, can anybody stop and take deep breaths and relax? Because, you know, really, and, and uh, let's say I was in that situation with that mountain lion. I either kill it or I run off and I'm safe. What's the first thing you do? <sighs> Isn't that what you do? That is your body triggering getting you out of fight and flight. But what we do is all the time we're, uh, 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 and then you drink 500 gallons of coffee a day, uh, uh, <laughs> thinking it's going to make up. When in reality, it's trusting in God right. and purposely. <sighs> it's that simple. If you'll stop and say, God, I trust in you. <sighs> and do that five, six, 15 times, you'll actually feel the physiology in your body begin to change. Your heart will slow down. The adrenaline and the cortisols begin to go down. You can start thinking again. All of a sudden, you get real rational. Boy, I don't really need that thing because then I'm going to have the stress of getting this and getting this, and my 42 inches is really good enough for the game. Logical thinking kicks back in. That's the last thing that Park Avenue wants you to do because if you can kick that in, they can't manipulate you to buy. You start buying based upon need, not want. When the prefrontal cortex is operating, you think logically, you plan, you research, you don't buy what they tell you to buy, you buy what you need, and you'll, you'll be a good biblical practitioner and buy the best product at the best price where Wall Street makes the least amount of money. Come on. Now, part of the problem is by us being completely in a fight or flight or desire constantly being bombarded with that, we have actually shrunk our prefrontal cortex. Because it's, you know, it's, you know I, there are places I used to have muscles, I just can't find them anymore. It's that same way with your brain. That you, that, the way that so Western society is and how stressful it is and, and our, our past and all these different things, by us being constantly in these states, we have neurologically reduced our ability to have self-control. That's why preachers don't preach anymore because it's physiologically and neurologically impossible unless you get back in the kingdom. You've got to get back to the commandments. You've got to get back to the kingdom. You've got to get back to submitting to divine authority. You've got to get back to understanding and dwelling in the shalom of God. <laughs> now, here are some things that we do that also can. Remember me telling you about the, the neuroplasticity. Sometimes, to us, it doesn't necessarily connect Deep, you know, just sitting down and relaxing, learning to dwell in the peace of God, reactivate your frontal cortex, okay, prefrontal cortex. There are some other things that can either diminish or build it up. The first thing you've got to stop doing, your brain was not created to multitask. You are not a quad-core computer. You are not an android. You are a human being. The Bible says, let no double-minded man, one who can hold two thoughts separately, ever think he's going to get anything from God. You were created to be single-minded. That's here. Now, here is really a deep thing. You can't text and drive. It takes two hands to drive, and it takes two hands to text. Do the math. 
and it takes one brain concentrating on the task at hand to get her done. When I multitask and try to multitask all the time, it reduces the size of your prefrontal cortex. It reduces your self-control. The cure, purposeful single-mindedness. And that is going to be hard for a brain that, is, that has been convinced it needs to double task and triple task. Biblical meditation is part of the cure. Now, in Eastern meditation, their, their, their concept of meditation is thoughtlessness to have nothing up there. When you do that, you invite something else in. Biblical or Semitic meditation is single thought. Single meditation. When I meditate on the word, when, when I'm mulling over this scripture, everything else is set aside, and I'm just concentrating on this one scripture, just mulling it over, concentrating on it. Now, for some of us, that may be just a little bit too much to begin with. You may just have to concentrate on your breathing. Because at the same time, breathing deep in, deep out is kicking you physiologically out of flight, fight or flight and kicking you into normal. And so for a while, you may just have to just, for you know, four, five, six minutes a day, just choose to relax. You know, Mary and I, we went through some of this, and this is even before I knew this stuff, that we went through so much in ministry. You know, when you have people trying to kill you in different things, you kind of tense up. Now all that's over, and you're still. And we, we would get tensed up, and the big old knots get in our back and stuff. And we're thinking, there ain't nothing going on. Why am I like this? It was, it was habit. And so part of what we did is we just sat down and say, okay, I, as an act of my will, I'm going to relax my muscles. And you go, okay, I'm relaxing my shoulder. I'm relaxing this shoulder. I'm going to concentrate on that knot in my back. Oh. We had to retrain our brains to relax. And so even while all you're, all you're thinking about is <gasps> deep breath in, Deep breath out. Your mind's going to go, what about this? What about this? What about this? Shh. I'm learning how to breathe. That's good. What about this? Or, oh, my knee, it just, oh, 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 oh. And you want to go, ignore it, or even scratch a different part of your body. Your body will go, <laughs> I made your knee itch, and you scratched your nose. It's disconnecting this because your, your brain is saying, I need to concentrate on something, something else. Just give me something else. Your toe hurts. Your joints hurt. You forgot to clean out the closet. Still it all, because what does all that do? What does that do? It causes stress, causes stress, causes stress. You, you are addicted to stress. When you're addicted to stress... You can't function in the kingdom. Your brain shut off. That's good. That's good. You're in the devil's back pocket because you can't have self-control because by the way that you have lived life and the way he has taught you, even though self-control can flow from your spirit, you have neurologically shut your brain off. The devil is divisive. He's devilish. He's sneaky. Learn to get, now once you get to where you can just breathe normal, then take one scripture and just spend some time, 10, 15, 20 minutes a day, just mull that scripture. God, what were you saying? What, what is this? And just go back over the scripture. Don't let any other distractions come in. That's how I got all this. That's how I got about the ark. Of, what am I going to put in my, what's my testimony I'm going to put in the ark? I was sitting there, chilling out in the Lord, being still and knowing that he's God. And just got my breathing down where it needed to be, and I just started thinking about that scripture. The moment I did, the Holy Spirit started taking over and says, yeah, and this means this, and this means this, and this means this. And the whole time, he's activating my prefrontal cortex because I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm understanding, I'm, I'm connecting the dots. And the more you connect the dots in the kingdom, the less you move in stress. 
God's got it covered. Peace that passes understanding is found in this place because even though the storm rages around you, you can be asleep in the boat. Now you understand Jesus. He had a greater truth. I don't need to freak out. I just need to speak to the storm because I move in delegated authority and the Father told that storm to shut up. Peace, be still. You can't do that in fight or flight. I, guys, and I, I, have, I, have, I, I have seen Deltas. Now, I, I was never around any Navy SEALs when I was in the military, but I was with, around Deltas. Those dudes are cool, cool as a cucumber. Bombs can be, go and they, they never kick into fight or flight. They just sit there and they're just cool. Okay, we're going to do this. And, and even a Navy SEAL, you, you know how they, now they, they may have a multiple agenda where they've got 10 to 15 targets to go through to, to get to the objective. You know how they do it? Because I've read their books. One at a time. Just knock down the one in front of you. Just chill out. You don't worry about the one 15 steps ahead. Here, here. And they maintain their composure so that they can think. The last thing the devil wants you to do is to be able to think biblically. He wants you into your instinct because right now your instinct has never been renewed to the word of God and you're going to kick into carnality. You're going to kick into the old man. You're going to kick into the law of sin and death unless you have meditated enough the scripture to get it down in your heart. To where, Let me tell you something. There, and we, we, uh, I've heard ministers talk about like a car accident. And one person was this lightly damaged. One was really hurt bad in the accident. The one that was hurt back was sitting there saying, I'm going to live and declare the works of the Lord. That was what was in their spirit. They, they, they were in that fight or flight, and their instinct was the word, the word, the word. Because they developed that in their lives. They meditated on Scripture. They learned to chill out in the Lord and in the power of his mind, okay? They learned how to be peaceful in God. Yeah. Then you had another person in the same accident, barely a scratch on them. And the guy set up and said, I'm a dead man. This is documented. Two months later, the woman that was severely injured was restored. The man who had no reason to die was dead. Because that was what was his instinct was to die. He was still moving in death. And in that situation, he released death into his life when he wasn't thinking. When I learn, when I learn how God has built me, I can get to the place that even if the devil gets me into a place where it's fight or flight, my instinctual response without thinking is the kingdom. That's the equivalent of coming up against a Navy SEAL. How many know that he can go through, he can jump through a troop and leap over a wall and he's still as cool as a cucumber? That's why sometimes in, in the action movies, you know, the guy's blowing up things and everything else and he's, oh, there's pizza. <laughs> you know, and this goes on, he's still cool because of what's in his heart. We need to learn to step out of the fight or flight. That's the whole operation of the world. That's what's going to sweep in the Antichrist. They constantly cause it. There's a war on terror. Everybody's going to be freaked out all the time when you get on a plane. Now there's the, the craziest one of our, now there's a war on women. Women, do you feel like there's a war against you? There's not a war on women in the Western culture. Men, real men stand up to protect women. But now they're using the war on women so that women can get on the front with the men. That, that neurologically and biologically will not work. Because the guy will instinctively right. protect the woman instead of killing the enemy. Right. Now, are women gifted? Extraordinarily. I tell you what, there, there's one woman that if it comes to brawling, you never want to mess with. Okay. I think, I think she could make a Navy SEAL turn white if she had to. But at the same time, that's not really where God has called her to be. Right. 
And it doesn't diminish her giftings, her callings, or her worth at all. It's that when men are fighting, war is, an, uh, war is called kill, 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 kill. How many know that's not really a place for a woman? Anybody that served in the military will tell you that. It's all these stupid politicians that have never served in the military that are trying to come with be politically correct. What I have found out usually politically correct is stuck on stupid. And they, 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 they try to constantly get this fight or flight. So, so you have all these women kicking into fight or flight. What do you mean I can't do this? What do you mean I can't die? What do you mean I can't? Well, if you want to die, go ahead, but I prefer you not. And I mean, there, there's, I watched this one retired female. She was a Marine. How many know a Marine, a Marine woman has something she can talk about? And she said, I don't want to be up there. She said, that, that, that's against the very nature of the way that I'm created. But see, when you get in this fight or flight, there's no reasoning. How many have seen people caught up in the world there's no reasoning with? You can't reason with them. They've shut their brain off by moving in the things of the world. Okay. A couple of other things I thought was very interesting. Lack of exercise diminishes your prefrontal cortex. Dang. I was hoping that exercise reduced it, and, you know, because exercise profits little. Glory to God. But I'll be, it stimulates the prefrontal cortex. The good news is, as little as five minutes at a time, we'll get her done. Glory to God. So a brisk walk at the mall will, will enable you to say no to the sales. Don't mosey. Walk like you mean it. By the time you get there, you can say no. Now, you can say this is funny, but they've even found like in, in rehab centers where people are getting off of drugs, if they will get them to exercising, they have 10 times the ability to resist relapse. And so all of America becoming couch potatoes, you're reducing your prefrontal cortex and you give in to advertising, you give in to every little stupid thing that's preached on Christian television or on the news broadcast or anything else that sounds easy. Well, that must be right. Here's another one. Lack of sleep will reduce, in fact, it causes a lot of chemical changes in your body. God created you for eight hours sleep. In fact, if you're a POW, the first step to breaking your will or to, to begin controlling your mind is sleep deprivation. So if the enemies use that to our troops to, to break their will, we are constantly self-inducing sleep deprivation and wondering why our will is not as strong as it used to be. It also causes, and in fact, for type 2 diabetes, sleep deprivation is one of the chief initial causes of type 2 diabetes because it will cause you to become insulin resistant. And the only way to reverse that is start forcing yourself to rest the way that you need to. Just wanted to throw that out. And we have... Get this, guys. We have a whole group of teenagers going to college. They don't exercise. They're constantly under stress, and they're sleep-deprived, and we wonder why they get stupid and crazy in college. Don't want no testimonies, although some could probably give them. We also need to learn to begin exercising spiritual and psychological control in our lives. We need to become conscious about the triggers the enemy uses to kick you in either desire or fight or flight and put a stop to it. As long as you're not aware of it, let me tell you something, they use it in advertising all the time. Did you know in the really big high dollar stores that they will actually lay out and arrange the store in a way that neurolog there's the neurological response to the layout of that store is to reduce your ability to say no. Dirty dog. Politicians, most politicians do not write their speeches. 
our current president most likely has not written one of his speeches. What he does is he goes to a professional speechwriter who is trained in in neurolinguistics and psychology to formulate the rhythm and the phraseology of that speech to trigger a neurological, physical, physiological response in the here that will bypass their will. That's modern politics. Learn what those things are. This, this is time, you know, get the book I was talking about. They got chapters on what these things are. Do some research. Find out how the enemy sneaks into your life and put a stop to it. Say, that's my trigger. And somebody tries to trigger me. I stop and I take authority. I surrender to God, the higher authority. I can then move in delegated authority. I will not fear. Did you know fear not? That phrase It's found 365 times in the Bible. You got one a day. I thought that was so cool. Fear not. And so I can literally, when when I'm confronted with something, I can stop, submit, move in delegated authority, take a deep breath, relax, get my brain kicked back in so that my brain and my spirit can work together to solve the problem. You do that, and you'll become one of the devil's worst enemies. He can't play you like a harp anymore. He can't push your buttons anymore. Every time, and they're, they're, now the response, you've been doing it for how many years? Your automatic response is, <gasps> or anger. Or for some of us, cheesecake. Where's the cheesecake? Pause, surrender, and then move in authority. If you'll do that, you're going to learn how to get self-control. Self-control flows out of the Spirit. It flows from the Holy Spirit abiding within. But then you also need to do the neurological and physiological things to function in what the Holy Spirit's trying to release in your spirit, man. You don't want it all caught up and bottled up in the Holy of Holies. You want it to be able to flow out into the holy place and into the outer court. I'm going to end with this. What do we call, what's another word for sickness? Disease. Disease. Disease is made up of two words. Dis-ease. Chronic stress. Chronic fight or flight. Chronic elevated adrenaline levels, elevated cortisol levels will cause dis-ease to take a hold of your body. It reduces your immune system. And did you know today, every one of us today, we have cancer cells in our body. That's a normal state. Cells get funky in their replication, and there is a mutation. But if your immune system every day kills hundreds of thousands of, of cancer cells a day, and that's its function, where we end up begin developing tumors is when your body is under such stress, the immune system can't kill the bad guys, and they begin multiplying and grouping together. And then once a tumor forms, it has learned to develop camouflage to where it hides itself from your immune system. Don't give it that foothold. Learn to move in the... See, that's one of the reasons why God equates shalom, peace, with salvation, safety, prosperity, healing, deliverance. It's all wrapped up. Because if I can stay in his peace... I can function in self-control. If I can function in self-control, everything in my spirit, in my soul, and in my body function for optimal health, optimal creativity. You can get more creative on the job if you can learn to step outside of that craziness. Come on. Now you know why half the people at work after they're there an hour or two, they get this blank look. The stress there shut down their brains. And you're, you're trying to tell them something and they can't understand. Huh? Huh? No, push the on button. Huh? Huh? 
No, really, right here, just push the on button. Huh? That stress has shut down their brains. <laughs> you've, you've ever worked in an office? Ever worked in a factory? You know what I'm talking about. What seems like child's play to you, once you get enough stress on that person, they can't do it. They just said to, all right, yeah, uh, 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 I know where the coffee maker is. That's, that's it. That, that, that's it. I know where the refrigerator and the snack machine is because that's the only way of getting down the cortisol levels. That's it. And so when I function and begin functioning in the kingdom, I step outside of that. Man, I'm coming up with creative ways of doing things. I'm coming up with the things that need to be done. I can move in authority if my brain and my spirit are engaged. Self-control. And in the last days, if you don't function on it the way things are now, how are you going to function in it when the way things are going to get? Don't wait till the prophecy starts hitting the fan to learn to function in self-control. It's better to learn to pull the cortisol levels down when they're here instead of when they're here. That's right. If you learn to do it now, it becomes instinctual later. When a military guy knows how to do soldier when they're not actually shooting back at him, when there's actually shots being returned this way, he can move in authority. Learn it now. God is saying, I want you to learn to move in your authority now, learn how to function the way that I created you now. If you can master self-control, you can do anything. No, that didn't sink in. That's right. If you master self-control under the authority of God, anything God needs you to do in the earth, you can do. Without that, you're never going to get it done. You're just playing church. You're walking as a Christian bragging about Jesus without a testimony except where you spend a few hours on the weekend. Oh. Guys, don't shout me down right now. <laughs> now this is good preaching. Your testimony is in place when they see you moving in authority, functioning in the commandments, having divine provision released in your life, and they come to you and say, what's different about you? And you can say, let me tell you about Jesus. They come to you because you got a testimony. Not just come to church on the weekend and be freaky with me. How many know we need to have a little bit better than that? I've seen some believers that are freaky. <laughs> they were crazy for the world. Now they're crazy for Jesus, but they're just plain crazy. Their brains have been shut off. Their favorite scripture is, think not. Glory to God. I can do that one. God, you have a brain. God wants you to use it all the time. He wants you to function the way in authority all the time. Guys, this is the first step. You get this down, you can start understanding authority. You can also understand why some guys get all rambunctious. They get up in the devil's face. They start rebuking principalities or powers. They start rebuking devils. The next thing you know, their life falls apart. They weren't under delegated authority. They just screamed at the devil with no respect for authority, commandments, or anything else. And they're the ones who got beat up and dragged off the playground. I want you guys to learn how to be God's special forces in the kingdom. It all starts with self-control. Father God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you that your word will not return to you void, but it will prosper in the thing whereunto you have sent it. And Father, I ask that you would enable us and give us your grace to heed to that which was delivered today, that we can learn how to function 
and the kingdom and move out of fight and flight and desire of worldly things, but, Father, about how to function in the law of the Spirit of Christ Jesus. And Father, we just ask that you would just keep building this, Father. Let us put us into practice. Let the Holy Spirit remind us in situations this week that we can choose to do the Word instead of the old thing that's always got us into trouble. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name.